Hey everybody, let's talk about heart blocks, baby. Yeah, heart blocks. Um, heart blocks, this is our unit four, and um, heart blocks actually um, don't refer to blockages in like the blood vessels that we've talked about before. That was our ischemia infarctions unit, uh, but this is more about the electrical flow. So the SA node talking to the AV node, then following to the bundle of his bundle branches, Purkinje fibers. So it's following the electrical flow through the heart. So that's what a heart block is. Somewhere there's a blockage in that um, electrical conduction, like the atria aren't talking to the ventricles or vice versa. Okay, so let's get started. Oops, let me go back one. So a sinus block, really quickly. I know we learned sinus arrest in the last unit, right? Sinus arrest was a nice long pause, right? So a sinus block is just a blockage in one of like one heartbeat. So it blocks the sinus atrial node one time and you'll see it right here you're just missing one beat basically that's called a sinus block okay so what that means is the electrical conduction from the SA node just stops for one time so it's just like this random little sinus block it may show up occasionally it may show up several times um, but just so you know it is there will be a full PQRST missing you won't see a little P wave you won't see anything else just like all of a sudden there should be a QRS there and it's not okay that's a sinus block a couple more examples now this shows one two three of them so sinus blocks if you can count out you can count out where the qrs's are now if we get up to three or more now we're getting into the sinus arrest so that's the difference between sinus block where you can count th up to three missing qrs's and then it goes into regular rhythm where a sinus arrest could be not even a p wave nothing just whoop, it goes and nothing happens for a long time and we have a much longer pause in there okay that 15 second range so that's the difference sinus blocks can be up to three beats that are missing it's typically one or two up to three and then more than three it's going to be your sinus arrest so that's the difference between the two okay nothing major don't Hang, get hung up about it or anything like that it's um they're very similar just that one is shorter than the other that's all all right so what are heart blocks in general it's a difficulty of communication between the atria and the ventricles typically um where the sa node is blocked to the ventricles or the sa node is blocked to the av node or the sa node is not working or so the av node takes over it's just some sort of level of blockage there are four basic different levels uh, categorized as blockages. There's one called first degree, then we have second degree type one, we also have second degree type two, and then we have third degree or a complete heart block. So if you wanna take a moment to write those down, go ahead. Remember, you can always pause the video if I'm going too fast and because you can do this at home and you're on your own pace. So perfect for you guys. Um, hopefully I don't talk too fast. <laughs> All right, so we have a first degree, Second degree type one, secondary type two, and third degree are complete. There's a couple other types of blocks too we're going to get into, but these are the four major or basic types of heart blocks. All right. So a first degree heart block where impulse gets held up in the AV junction. So it means that our P to R interval is going to be elongated. Remember, our normal P to R interval is supposed to be 0.12 to 0.20 seconds, and it's going to be longer than that. So it could be 0.21. I've seen it as big as point four i think it's really long 0 0.28 0 0.27 i see those quite often actually the first degree heart block basically is benign the doctors don't really care about that one it comes and goes it's a small little blip in the matrix if you will it's not going to do it's not going to cause them to pass out or or you know anything like that so it's not really something they worry about we move up to second degree type one so those P to R intervals will start out normal. You'll see a normal P to R interval, and I'll show you in these EKGs coming up soon, that you'll see the P to R interval is gonna get longer and longer and longer until that QRS is completely dropped. It usually happens for three runs. You have regular, longer, longer, drop. Regular, longer, longer, drop. I have seen it for four, but we usually see a three run um, secondary type one. And we'll get more into it more in a, in a moment. So second degree type two, um, some beats get through the junction and some don't. Your P to R interval stays constant on this one, but you're just gonna be have random like QRSs that are missing. You'll see P wave, no QRS. P wave, no QRS. <laughs> they might come in patterns, they may not come in patterns. It just looks really weird. They're gonna get a little concerned with this one because as soon as we have P wave, 
you know, atria depolarizing and then the ventricles are not depolarizing right after. We have a little bit of a backup in the system. So it's uh, something they definitely want to keep an eye on. And if it gets too persistent and um, if they're having symptoms and stuff with it, they may consider a pacemaker or something. Third degree heart block or complete. Um, that means the atria and the ventricle are not talking to each other. It's like a bad marriage or a bad relationship. <laughs> yeah. They don't talk to each other. And because the atria start the, starts the heartbeat, it, it goes into panic mode. So because the ventricles are not talking. So the atria go into panic mode. And it's, so it usually speeds up really fast. Usually we see tachycardic P waves. And then the QRSs are sitting back in their lounge chair going, did I just hear him? I don't know. I'm going to beat now. Boom. And it's like, mm, maybe I'll beat now. So the ventricular rate is going to be slow. Your atrial rate, the distance between the P to P waves, is going to be fast, typically. That's how it usually happens. Okay. So a total disassociation between the atrial and the ventricle. They don't talk to each other. Yeah. Pretty funny. Okay. Oops. I think I'm going too fast. Okay. First degree heart block. Um, this is what it looks like. Again, it's just a slowed or delayed uh, conduction from through the AV node. So it makes that P to R interval a little bit longer than normal. It actually looks like a regular rhythm when you look at it. When I took, I had to take a certification exam for, for what I do at the hospital. And um, when I looked at, there was one like this on the certification exam. I saw this and I was like, well, that's normal sinus rhythm. I was like, that's, a, that's NSR, but it wasn't a choice in the drop down menu. I was like, mm, um, what could this be? And then I took a closer look. If I look at that P to R and I start here, go all the way over to here. It's definitely longer than the five boxes, five little boxes we're supposed to, it's supposed to be. It is, that is four and four. It's about eight little boxes wide. Okay. This one down here is so extreme that so long elongated that the P wave is right at the end of the T wave. It's almost embedded into the T wave. That's a very, very long P to R interval. You can see there. Okay. So sometimes it's so long, it gets stuck to the T wave. Again, they consider this benign. Doctors don't really care about this one unless they're having active symptoms that go with it. We've talked about that a lot throughout the, the program is if they have active symptoms, we treat for the symptoms. If the symptoms don't go away, then we have to do something else about it. This is not one they would typically have to do some sort of surgery for though. Okay. All right. So um, this is just some more uh, examples. If you can find the P wave. I'll give you just a couple seconds. It definitely is, they're both definitely longer than 0.20 seconds, uh, meaning more than five little boxes. So in this top one up here, did you find the P wave? This is the P wave right here at the end of the T wave. If I start at the P wave and head all the way over to here, again, we're about eight boxes, eight little boxes. So eight little boxes, that's 0.32, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Down here, this is the P wave. You can definitely see it's further away from the QRS than we'd like it. This is, wow, this is really long. So this is five, 10, like 13. 13, that's really long. I can't do that math in my head today. Nope, I can't. 13, 13 times 0.04 is 0.52. That's a really elongated P to R interval. Okay, but that's what they look like, just in case. You run into that. You'll definitely run into it on the test. All right, so let's get into second degree type one. Like I said, this one is um, that one that Peter R gets longer. This actually has three names, believe it or not, and they're all interchangeable. And doctors use these interchangeable. Um, they like to call it Winky Bach, though. You know, when you discover something, you get to name something after yourself. So this guy discovered Winky Bach. His last name's Winky Bach. That's pronounced Winky Bach. It's also called Mobitz one. Second degree type one, Mobitz one, or Winky Block. Okay. Yes, three different names with the same exact heart block. You know, they just couldn't come up with their a final decision, I guess. Um, so again, the P to R interval is going to get longer and longer and longer until that QRS is eventually just dropped. That will start over again. Okay. The A rate and V rate is going to look like an irregular rhythm, but they're going to stay pretty consistent. You're still going to see the 60 to 100 beats per minute. B rate should stay the, the, about that and the A rate should stay about that. So if we had a full strip, because it looks so irregular, we take a full strip, you know, add them up, multiply times six, right? We can find the A rate that way and the B rate. The, it looks very irregular. So let's take a look at this pattern down here. So I'm going to start with this EKG, this QRS right here. 
and notice that this is a very normal P to R interval. The P wave is close to the QRS, so it's normal. We move over to the next one, and now we've got a little bit longer. See how it got a little bit longer? Over here, it's even longer. And then where there should have been a QRS, like right here, there is no longer a QRS. It just skipped that beat. It's like it resets itself. And then it actually does. So we go back to the next one. We go back to a normal P to R interval. And over here, you can kind of see it's off the end. This is uh, the normal P to R interval. And then we have a longer one, a longer one, and it's dropped. And then we start over again. So again, it's usually three, one, two, three, and drop. I occasionally see four and then drop. But this is almost exactly what it is every single time, three and drop or four and drop. Um, this is just telling me what happens during the second degree AV block type one, um, where it's, you know, it just taking longer and longer. It's blocked. The block gets bigger and bigger, basically block, 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 and then it goes back. Okay. So causes of this, they, it's lots of different things that can cause it, but most of the time it's just, if we keep ourselves healthy, we are, have much less chance of getting any type of heart block or arrhythmia. Right. So causes can include infections. They've had a, a previous MI, uh, drug toxicity, toxicity um, and that could be uh, on purpose that they took that many drugs or it can be accidental, too. So um, anytime we have congenital heart disease uh, and then it's not lethal. Again, it can indicate a little bit of damage to the conduction system. So, again, we just kind of. Um, deal with it based on symptoms, not necessarily any type of surgeries or intervention is needed at that point. So we just kind of deal with it with symptoms at first. It might be, um, you know, taking antiarrhythmia drugs or we have blockers if it's fast, that sort of thing. All right, there's some more examples. I'm going to throw all these up here. So the P wave here, this is kind of weird looking here. It's longer and longer, and then it's dropped. It's kind of long and longer, and then it's dropped. So this one only goes two times. It's even the first one's a little bit long, and then it's definitely longer, and then we have a P wave with no QRS. And then even the first one's a little bit long, this is longer, and then we have a no QRS. That's what's happening here. Down here, the P wave's teeny tiny, but I can see right here, this is the P, the Q, P to R right here. I move over here. It is definitely longer here. It's definitely longer here. And then I do have a P wave with no QRS. We go back to a normal length, a little bit longer, a little bit longer, and then we drop again. Yeah. I need to update my pictures. Okay. So we get, like I said, they could come in patterns. So occasionally they come in this pattern called a two to one. They will occasionally come in a three to one conduction. And that's, um, the how many p waves there are per qrs so the one at the front the two is we have two p waves for every qrs for one qrs so if you take a look down here you'll have a p wave p wave qrs p wave p wave qrs yeah so it just comes like that <laughs> in a pattern so you have one p wave that that makes the QRS go and one P wave that does it. One P wave that makes the QRS go, one P wave that does it. So the A rate is going to be twice the ventricular rate because we have twice as many P waves as we do QRSs, right? Two P waves, one QRS, two P waves, one QRS. So if I took the distance between the P waves and the distance between the QRSs, this would be twice as long as this. I'm sorry, this would be the R to R would be twice as long as the P to P. The R to R would be twice as long as the P to P. I know you needed me to say that a second time. <laughs> and if you need it a third time, you'll have to rewind. Okay. All right, so can you see the two to one pattern on these two EKGs below? Pretty identifiable, actually. You're looking for two P waves for every QRS. Two P waves for every QRS. Same down here, P wave, P wave, QRS, P wave, P wave, QRS. There's a space where the QRS should be, and it's just missing. So it, some, it's getting through every other time. So it's like you're trying to get your kid to clean his room, and they do it about half the time. One time you tell him it doesn't do anything. Second time, he does it. <laughs> That's exactly what that is.
at least that's how my teenage were teenagers were actually they were more like a three or a four to one pattern i'll be honest <laughs> okay here's the type two second degree type two so we're moving up this is not called winky bock two okay it is called mobitz two but we don't add a winky bock two in there so this has two names second degree type two or mobitz two so the p to r interval does state normal length normal size we do are going to have some p waves though that do not have qrs's so it's going to look like a very irregular rhythm and you'll have p waves randomly placed and no qrs to follow it so the p wave is firing and the qrs just can't hear it okay there's that teenage kid again that doesn't want to clean his room so we're telling them they got to do it and they don't hear us. Okay. Here's where they scream it out. Okay. Ventricles squeeze and they don't do it. Ventricles squeeze. They don't do it. Finally, they go back into a pattern where they do. And then we get another one where it's gone. So a lot of times these come very haphazardly. You'll see a couple of them in a row, one in a row. You'll have four or five regular beats. And then you'll have another one very irregular, um, but they can come in patterns like the last one did too. Just take a look at this um, real quick example of the second degree block. And you'll see some regular beats. And then a random P wave with no QRS. And it goes back to regular. A random P wave with no QRS. And here we go here. P wave, no QRS. P wave, no QRS. So the difference between second degree type 1 and second degree type 2 is that in type 1, that P to R gets longer, longer, longer before the QRS is dropped. And this one, it's normal P to R all the way through. It's just that you have P waves without QRS is just randomly placed. Okay. Okay, so second degree AV block can have a three to one ratio as well. So that's going to be three P waves for every QRS. It's looks really it's actually really easy to point out so you can see the p waves just kind of marching along and then there's a definite pattern that forms down there see so a p wave here p wave p wave qrst p p p qrst so we have three p waves one two three and a qrst one two three and a qrst okay that's a three to one ratio the bigger number is always referring to the p waves the one is referring to the qrs okay pretty identifiable Okay, now we get into third degree heart block. These look, this is sometimes difficult to figure out what you're looking at. Okay, you do, I even still have to kind of look at it and go, is that a third degree heart block? I really can't tell. Okay, so this is when um, there's a total disassociation between the atrium and the ventricle. There's a complete block here. This one is not talking to this one. There's complete blockage there. Okay. Um, P waves keep marching through. In fact, they get a little upset. So because their QRS is not listening, so they they get hyper. They go tend to go fast. They tend to be tacky. The QRS, on the other hand, is the other end of this going. I don't know when they want me to do stuff. Maybe I'll do it tomorrow. And then they throw a beat. Okay, <laughs> it's kind of how it goes. But they are completely independent of each other. So down here, I find the QRSs and then I determine the V rate. And if the V rate is slow, typically that 40 to 60, we think of it as a, uh, a junctional escape or uh, something like that, then um, it's gonna be low, okay? We go 300, 150, 175, 60, 50, 40. Yeah, it's 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, about 41, I think. 41 divided by 1500. Sorry, 1500 divided by 41, Put the other way. This heart rate's 36, so the ventricular rate is 36. But then I look at the P waves. That's a P wave, that's a P wave, that's a P wave, P, P. There's a P wave right there, buried in this QRS. P, 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 P. See how they just randomly place, they're not, they're not associated with any QRS whatsoever. Um, it may look like it's normal once in a while, like this one kind of showed up in the right place, but all these other ones don't make any sense at all. They're all in very randomly places, one right after the QRS. What the heck, right? Yeah. So 350. Yeah, this one is beating um, over 100. 10, 15, 16, 17, about 18. 
1500 divided by 18 gives me, no, that's not right. Thirteen. <laughs> Fifteen hundred divided by thirteen, not eighteen. That's one fifteen. So the P waves are going at one. The atrial rate is going at one fifteen beats per minute, and the ventricular rate was going about thirty six. So the P waves, like I said, they get upset and worried, so they go into panic mode and start going fast. And the QRSs can't hear them, so they're just on vacation in the lounge chair. Yeah. We'll look at some more. Here's one down here. So it's, it's just showing there's a complete total block here. So this one does not talk to this one. It can't, they don't, they're not getting any signals through whatsoever. This person needs a pacemaker, okay? There, it's, there's no getting around it. The heart rate, the V rate is going to be really slow. With the the atria are going to keep depolarizing. The ventricles aren't going to be able to keep up. We're going to have some pooling of blood, some blood clots. They're going to feel real dizzy. They're going to have chest pain. They're going to have lots of different symptoms with this one. So the P waves here, P, here's a P wave, P, P, P wave, P wave. P wave has got to be in here. And P wave here, it's like, they don't match up, okay? So this is what um, third degree looks like. I've said all this before, so I'll just leave it up here for a moment, but it's basically the complete lack of communication, like I said. Those QRSs are typically going really slow and the P waves are going fast. Mm -hmm. And this person is going to need a pacemaker. Yes. If you want to pause it here so you can fill out your notes, go ahead. But I've said all these things already, so I'm going to move on. And I did, I said all these too also. Uh, well, I haven't. All right. So extremely, it's again, it's a, an extremely unstable rhythm. They have a poor cardiac output, um, not getting the oxygen that they're supposed to. Make sure you're checking um, you're checking their ABCs, their oxygen, give them fluids. Um, we'll need an emergency pacer or pacemaker implanted. Um, and it could progress to asystole if the ventricular pacer just quits talking to the atrial altogether, I mean, just quits moving. If your ventricle stops, so does the blood flow. So we got a problem. And if you look down here, again, there's a P wave here and a P and a P wave. They're all randomly placed. It looks very strange. Again, if your QRSs are going slow and you see a lot of extra P waves all randomly placed, this is a third degree. All right, I think someone asked me about this heart block poem, but it works. If you're good, if, like if you're good at remembering this stuff, this was going to work for you. So if the R is far from the P, then you have first degree. Longer, longer, longer drop, then you have a winky bonk. If some P's don't get through, then you have Mobitz too. If P's and Q's don't agree, then you have third degree. So if that helps you, obviously use it. Sometimes it helps me when I do stuff like that. So I put that up there for you if you want to use it. Okay, let's get into the bundle branch blocks. Let's talk about our left bundle branch block. So remember our heart has the septum down the center and each of the bundle branches run down each side. Right? We have the right bundle branch and we have the left bundle branch running down each side of the septum. And when they take a turn, they become Purkinje fibers. So when we have a left bundle branch block, we have a blockage in the electrical flow of the left bundle branch that runs down that septum, okay? It goes kind of delayed. So it runs down that left side of the septum, and because it's delayed, um, it's going to contract later than the right ventricle. The right ventricle is going to contract kind of first, and the left ventricle is going to contract after it. So, I mean, we're talking fractions of seconds, but they're supposed to go at the same time. They don't goes a little bit later, because it goes a little later and it's delayed, it causes these really wide QRSs. And if you remember, um, this is this is um, what a PVC looked like. Remember this looked like a PVC? Yeah, and PVCs, and we also talked about VTAC. Now VTAC looks just like this, except the heart rate is much faster. So this is the left bundle branch block. We, um, we can tell the difference between VTAC and the left bundle because this would look like monomorphic, but it's not monomorphic because it's not fast. We have a heart rate of, it's about 90, taking a quick look at it, about 90. So that's a normal heart rate for us. So that's that NSR heart rate. This is one reason we don't put a, a patient with a left bundle branch block on a treadmill 
because if we get their heart rate up, then they're in VTAC. Oops. <laughs> and um, these people take they take uh, beta blockers because they don't we don't want their heart rate up because if we push it up too high, then we kick them into VTAC. Not cool. Yeah. All right. And then on the reverse of that, we have can have a bundle branch block on the right side. So our RBBB, right bundle branch block. And since this one is not talking, the right bundle branch can't make it through. It comes, gets here and it's like, I can't go any further. So it takes a road sideways. It goes, e -e -e, e -e -e, and then goes, because it goes sideways like that, it creates these rabbit ears, this rabbit ear effect. And um, remember that V1 and V2 are placed on the anterior part of the heart, just right of the septum. And V3 and 4 are placed on the anterior part of the heart, left of the septum. So because this is interfering with the right septum, the right bundle branch, we're going to see a change in V1 and V2. And V1 and V2, you're going to see this, it's called a rabbit ear phenomenon, basically. It's called an RSR, really. I call it rabbit ears. It says this little boop, 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 e, e, e. I have a better picture on the next, next slide here. Here we go. So if you've ever seen this, especially in V1 and V2, where it kind of looks like this, a little rabbit ears thing, that is sure sign that this is a right bundle branch block. And again, you will see it in V1 and V2 because your right bundle branch is sitting right underneath V1 and V2, right on the right side of the septum. So it's picking up there. You occasionally will see it in V3 as well, just depending on placement of V3. But you're looking for rabbit ears. Rabbit ears in V1 and V2, right bundle branch. RSR. Okay, so pacemakers, I just kind of briefly touched on that with the complete heart blocks, but some of you know about pacemakers, some of you don't. So pacemakers are actually implanted, obviously, into your body. They are permanent implantation um, once you have a bad enough arrhythmia that you need help, basically. You need intervention. So it's a little device that fits under the skin. Um, the ones you're implanting now are much smaller. They're like dime size now so they don't look quite as big as this now a uh, fun fact everyone always thinks that they put them on the left side automatically because the heart's on the left side they do not they put it on your less dominant side so if you are left-handed it's going to go on the right side yes fun fact but most of the time most people are right-handed right so they put it on the left side um, but it can be these lead wires come in there and it can be attached to either the right, either the atria or the ventricle, or even sometimes both, depending on how severe the block is, the um, heart blockage is. So they're going to, um, they'll place it where they need it. If the SA node's not working, they'll place it in the atria. If the ventricle, atria and ventricle aren't talking to each other, sometimes they'll place them in both. So it knows when it's supposed to, and they can set the timer on it and make it as a little dial they turn. They can go fast, they can go slow, they can shut it off, they can do all kinds of stuff while it's inside your body. It's pretty cool. It does live inside you for the rest of your life. Um, they do switch it out occasionally for a better version, you know, like upgrade. Um, they do have to switch out the battery at least every seven to 10 years. I have had someone come into the ED before and she's like, I'm beeping. I'm like, you're beeping? She's like, my pacemaker is beeping. I'm like, when's the last time you saw the cardiologist? She goes, I don't know, a few years ago? I was like, you have a pacemaker and you haven't seen the cardiologist? Um, <laughs> beeping means that the battery's going to die. You know, like your, like your um, fire thing, your smoke detectors. It's just like that. So she had like another two days and then it was going to completely die. And if your pacemaker dies, you die. <laughs> I, I don't understand some people sometimes. Anyway, that was fun. This is a little video. If you want to go back and watch this on your end of it, you can. It's a little video on how they implant them. Um, on the other side, on the flip side, we also have defibrillators. They look exactly the same. They go in the same place in the same way. A lot of times people will get both of them. They're kind of into one, one little device. I call that the Cadillac version. So it's a defibrillator and a pacemaker at the same time. And basically it's your own little AED. So if you go into a bad rhythm like VTAC or SVT and your heart, it stays that way for a certain amount of time, it will shock you back into rhythm. That shock you. <laughs> You're wide awake and it's happening. It's like, a, I'm told it's like a, a horse kicking in the chest. Yeah. Yes. And they have malfunctioned before um, and or picked up an arrhythmia they thought was an arrhythmia and it wasn't and shocked people. Anytime it goes off, they have to report to the emergency room immediately, of course. 
and then we have to download the information. I have a little, a cool little interrogation machine that I use at work. Um, it's a little wand that fits over their device and it downloads all the information that was stored on the pacemaker and defibrillator during that event. It's actually, it stores everything with the heart, every single heartbeat, every single everything of the heart. And you can download that every night. A lot of them do it every night, sometimes once a week, whatever. But I can get all the information on it and have it for the docs ready. It's really kind of cool. So it will shock the, the patient back into rhythm or attempt to anyway. But you should definitely go to the ER if that happens. Yes. All right. So when we have a pacemaker, um, typically we can actually, well, we can see where it's placed. We can tell where it's placed. Okay. So if we place it in the atria and because the SA node is not working anymore, since the P wave represents the SA node firing, but now the P wave is not going to be there because the SA node is not firing, it's replaced with what's called a pacer spike. So this is what's circled down here. See this little spike in front of it? We have a little spike and a regular QRST. So that little spike is taking place of the atria, of the SA node that would normally be working. So if your SA node's not working, they'll put a wire where the SA node is located and it will shock your heart into rhythm, whatever beats a minute they set it, it's usually 60 or 70 beats per minute. And that is what shows up on the EKG instead of the P wave. Now I can tell now that just by looking at this, that I know that lead wire is placed in the atria because I have a regular QRST after it. And it, the only thing that's replaced is the P wave with a pacer spike. Okay. So when you look at, when you look at a ventricular paste, which is on the next page here, it looks different, right? Ventricular paste, they look like PVCs because they're starting in the ventricle. Again, another thing that looks maybe like left bundle branch or like VTAC, except that it's not fast, number one, so it can't be VTAC, and it can't be left bundle because there is a pacer spike in front of it. So this left bundle branch and the uh, uh, ventricular pace rhythms look very similar until you notice there's a pacer spike in front of it, okay? So what that means is the lead wire that's starting the heartbeat is placed or was implanted into the ventricle instead of the atria. Okay. So it's starting the ventricle. So the SA node knows what to do. It just can't talk to the ventricles or the ventricle, the ventricular pacer isn't working for whatever reason they put it in the ventricle and now it looks big and wide like a PVC because it's ventricular paste. And we know it's paste because it has that little pacer spike. Okay. All right. Occasionally, we have someone that has a pacemaker implanted that doesn't work all the time um, because the heart can do it can beat on its own most of the time, but occasionally it gets lazy and it can't do it, so the pacemaker just takes over. So this is called an occasional pacemaker. The first time I saw this on a rhythm strip at the hospital, I was I freaked out. I, thought, I was like, "What is happening? Is pace just not working?" Oh no! And then I was like, "Because you can see a ventricular pace here, and then it goes into regular rhythm." I'm like, his pacemaker stopped working. Oh no. Like, I'm like, he's got five beats and then he's going to die. That's in my head. I'm thinking, right? That's not what happened. He has one that's supposed to kick in. So the SA node does work sometimes and then it gets a little lazy or gets a little tired and the ventricular pacer will take over. Who knew? Well, I found out really quickly. Yes, I did. So if you see it kind of flip flow back and forth, you can tell this is a pacer spike right here and this is a ventricular paced one and this is a regular PQRC. This is the same patient. Just pacers working here and SA nodes working here. So it looks kind of weird on the EKG. Yeah, they hop back and forth taking turns. Okay, we're going to practice now. I'm going to just let you pause for a moment. I'm going to pause for like 10 seconds, let you take a look at that top EKG. You can look at the bottom one too, but see if you can figure out. We learned some things about P to R intervals. So take a look at the P to R intervals for sure. And, um, and if there's QRSs that match up. That's what we're looking at today. If you're still thumbing through your notes and want to take another couple of seconds, then you can pause before I give you the answer. Okay, this one up top, take a look at that P to R interval. Right here, I can see this is a very normal P to R interval. It's actually kind of close to the QRS. But over here, it's a little bit longer and yet a little bit longer. And then I have a P wave with nothing. We go right back to a normal P to R, a little bit longer, and a little bit longer, and then I have one missing. 
So this is a very classic Winky Bach. Second degree type one or Mobitz one or Winky Bach. This is Winky. We're winking at you. Down here, I can see that the Peter Arnival is a little bit elongated, but it stays elongated for every single beat that I have that matches the QRS. But I do have some random P waves without QRSs. So, and they're random. There's no pattern coming. So this is going to be my second degree type two or Mobitz two. It's not called Winky, Winky Bach. This is second degree type two because that Peter Arnival does stay the same throughout. And I have P waves without QRSs. Okay. Rewind it again if you didn't quite catch it the first time. And then you just watch it over. All right, this one. Take a look at the rhythm strip down bottom. I'm going to give you a few seconds to take a look. Try to match up your P waves with your QRSs. Look at some P to R intervals. And see how fast the P waves are going. Okay. This is a P wave right here. Then I have another P wave. And another P wave, and another P wave, and a 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 P wave. They don't make any sense at all. And they're coming pretty fast. They're just above 100. They're coming pretty fast. Those P waves don't match up with QRSs at all. Now, this QRS is more, it's faster than a normal third degree. This is a third degree or complete heart block. QRS is a little faster. 350, 100, 75. It's, a, it's just a little over 75. So, this is faster than what you would normally see for a um complete heart block as far as the qrs's go but the p waves are all over the place they don't match up at all so this is a definite complete heart block okay this should jump out at you it looks the qrs's are very wide so what does that indicate double check the heart rate so it can't be vtac now check to see if there's a pacer spike. There's no pacer spike. Because this is a big wide QRS and it's not tachycardic like VTAC and there is no pacer spike in front, this is a left bundle branch block. It's delayed going through the left bundle. So the right ventricle squeezes before the left ventricle squeezes and we end up with a wide QRS. Okay, you should see those jump out at you. Do you see the rabbit ears? V1 and V2? I'll circle them for you. Here's rabbit ears here and rabbit ears here, also called an RSR. A little bit of rabbit ear here too. This is a right bundle branch block. Right away, you should see the rabbit ears in V1 and 2 and know that this is a right bundle branch block. Okay, it circled the P wave for you so you can see where the P wave is located. That P wave that's circled is definitely elongated. That P to R interval is definitely elongated. So we'll double check the other P to R intervals and see if they're all the same. They seem to be. So if it's just an elongated P to R, I don't have any drop beats. This is just first degree. Did you say first degree? Awesome. So first degree, yes. First degree heart block. It is benign. They don't care about this one. <laughs> They'll take an EKG once in a while, but they're not going to do any intervention for this. Okay, the one up top. Do you see the pacer spike? Right in front of a normal QRST. So if there's a pacer spike in front of a normal QRST, this is an atrial paced rhythm. It's atrial paced because it starts in the atria. And we know that because we have a normal QRST and this pacer spike is there in place of the SA node, in place of the P wave. The one below it also has a pacer spike. Do you see that? Some of them are big pacer spikes. 
So this is a unique one because I, we do see this occasionally where the P wave works, but it doesn't talk to the ventricles. So the ventricle pacer goes after the P wave, P wave ventricle pacer. So you can see they have a block, some sort of heart block where the P wave is along, like this one's really elongated and then the ventricle goes off and the ventricle goes off and the ventricle goes off. <laughs> the ventricle is keeping its pace like it's supposed to. It's almost like a winky block here. And then the P waves, the P to R interval does elongate, but the QRS goes on a very specific cadence because it's set that way. This person might need an atrial and ventricular pace eventually. Okay, what's happening there? This is the one I freaked out at. <laughs> yeah. I see some regular beats and then all of a sudden I see these big wide ones. So most of the time we'd probably say, hey, wait, this is just three PVCs in a row. This is a triplet, right? But take a look closely. There is a pacer spike in front of them, okay? Pacer spikes are there. So this is an occasional pacemaker. It's going back and forth, back and forth. Regular PQRST, pacer spike, and big wide. So it's a it's an occasional pacemaker where the ventricular pacer takes over occasionally. And what kind of blocks are these? These are new ones I haven't learned before. <laughs> this is what sinus arrest should look like, anyway. That's what I'm just saying. Lethal arrhythmia, H and R block, CD block, Winky block. Yeah, that's what the, <laughs> those were for fun, obviously. Obviously. All right, that is it for the lesson today. Hopefully you learned something today and um, I will see you. I have, I think I'm gonna see you next week. So I will see you next week in class where we wrap this all up and we're just about done, my friends. Keep being awesome and I will see you soon.